Mr. Uh, Upendranath Bhupal, uh, would you want to take over from here then? Yeah, yes, ma'am. That, sure. that would be nice. We are unable to see your video though, but... Uh, yeah, I should apologize for that because I'm using my mobile hotspot for the streaming. Uh, oh, the video okay. has not been restored by Geo Fiber so far. There has been some unexpected uh, shutdown of the services since morning. Oh, okay, okay. So what I'll do is in the meanwhile, let me give you the rights to share your screen. Okay. Are you able to see, Mom? Yes, we can. If you could just go to the slideshow, right? Yeah. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, I think we have one more question for Mr. Mundada in the Q&A box. Mr. Mundada, what I would suggest is if you could type the answer there uh, so that, you know, while uh, uh, Mr. Bhupal continues with his speaking slot, you could have that question answered as well by just typing out the answer for the attendee. Thank you so much. It's from uh, Pashupati Gorai, the question. Thank you. Uh, yes, Mr. Bhupal, you could start now. Thank you. Uh, you will all see that my presentation is going to be an extension of uh, what Mr. Kamal Kishore has already presented. Uh, the one point that he has covered is regarding the performance of cooling towers and how it affects the condenser performance. So my presentation is going to be dedicated to that one point. Uh, this uh, particular picture shows the functioning of the cooling tower and its location in uh, a coal-based thermal power plant. Now the cooling tower is part of the service water system where the hot water from the condenser after doing its work in condensing the steam is given back to the cooling tower for cooling. Now the cool water enters the condenser back. So, and this is a service water cycle where the heating and cooling goes on. Now the condenser efficiency, which is very important for the overall heat rate of the power plant depends on the function of the cooling tower. So that has already been covered by uh, the speakers uh, before me. Now, the reasons uh, for the uh, higher gross heat rate, the other speakers have already covered for the BTG packages. So I'll be looking at how the cooling tower performance affects the heat rate. So if you look at uh, the point number 11, which is a high cooling water inlet temperature due to poor performance of the cooling tower. So this was also one of the points in uh, Mr. Kamal Kishore's uh, slide. But then I'll be elaborating on the reasons specific to the cooling tower as to why its performance deteriorates. Now, if you look at this particular side, the reasons that, that contribute to the shortfall in performance of the cooling tower could be any of these and many more. So in brief, these are some of the reasons which are the original design shortfall, that is undersizing the cooling tower which is the common terminology used in the industry. This is one of the major contributing factors for the shortfall in performance of the cooling tower. Even though there are many other reasons uh, that relate to the operational aspects of the cooling tower, the fundamental reason for the shortfall in cooling tower performance is the original design shortfall. Now, how is that the industry is able to confidently establish as the one of the most important reasons for the shortfall in performance is these days, starting with NTPC, many of the end users have started specifying a third party performance guarantee test. Usually in the past, the performance guarantee test was conducted by the contractor, the cooling tower contractor himself, where the control on the results of the performance testing was with the contractor. Now that scenario has changed where the end users are specifying a third party performance guarantee test specifically through licensed testing agencies from CTI. The CTI is the Cooling Technology Institute, which is basically the provider of technology worldwide. So in Asia, CTI is more popular than in Europe. So we do not have any codes uh, regarding the design and testing of cooling towers in Asia. So CTI is quite popular here. So CTI has five listed performance guarantee testing agencies with them. Four of them are in the US, one is in Australia. And a new testing agency in Germany is in Germany now. Now, after the advent of the CTI testing agencies in India, 
for the first time, all the end users, especially the public sector undertakings, where contractually it is necessary for the contractor to get his cooling towers tested by CTI third party agencies. The results have been abysmal. In the past, every tower used to pass the PG test, but after the specification of CTI agencies, the average uh, thermal capability of a cooling tower has fallen from <clears throat> 65% to about 65%, which is a clear indication that the contractors are unable to manage uh, the results of the uh, PG test because of the <coughs> presence of uh, CTI agencies at site. Now, if we leave alone uh, testing for the moment, the other reasons are erroneous specifications of thermal duty parameters. The one would wonder as to how can the specification be wrong in terms of thermal parameters. As far as the BTG package thermal duty is concerned, there should be no problem. But the problem comes when specifying the ambient duty parameters, which are the wet bulb temperature and the relative humidity. I remember one of the speakers has uh, touched upon this topic briefly. The major problem in determining the combination of wet bulb temperature and relative humidity, which is especially necessary for a natural draft cooling tower, <coughs> the relative humidity assumes significance. But for an induced draft cooling tower, the determination of uh, the wet bulb temperature alone would be enough. There are enough guidelines in India as well as uh, ASHRAE. I'm sending you the slides. Uh, okay, there was a brief interruption. Oh, I sorry. Uh, Mr. Bandapadhyay, request you to please mute yourself. Aye, aye, aye. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, the determination of the wet bulb temperature and the coincidental relative humidity or the dry bulb temperature is quite easy, provided one has the metallurgical data for that particular area. For example, if you are talking about a power plant like NTVC Ramagundam, uh, the nearest metallurgical department, it could be in Hyderabad or any other place nearby, the nearest metallurgical station will be able to provide you uh, the hourly record of uh, the ambient data, which should mainly provide wet bulb, RH, or dry bulb temperature, two of these three. The other data, if it is available, it's good, like ambient pressure. But then uh, for the determination of ambient thermal uh, design duty parameters, we require only two, WBT and DBT or RH. So based on the hourly record of the meteorological data for at least three to five years, it is possible to perform a statistical analysis to arrive at the design combination of WBT and RH in such a way that this combination is exceeded by only 5% uh, for the duration under consideration. In India, uh, being a tropical country, the duration under consideration is generally from April to September. That is where the wet well temperatures are supposed to be high. And some of the speakers have already said the performance of the cooling tower during the rest of the months is generally ignored because the cold water temperature is achievable. Even though the cold water temperature is achievable, it is being achieved at a cost because the coal consumption per megawatt of generation is always high because the cooling tower is not performing. But the temporary satisfaction is that the design cold water temperature is achieved at, a, at an extra cost to generation. But during the peak summer months or the post monsoon months where the wet bulb temperature is high, the cooling tower will underperform if the uh, statistical analysis is not done based on the meteorological uh, data. So that is one important consideration. And there are several plants, uh, two to name a few where I have heard. One is the NLC Tutigurin power plant. The NLC power plant. Yeah, there is some echo. Uh, uh, Mr. Bandupadhyay, again requesting you to please Mr. mute Bandupadhyay, yourself. So it is done. The NLC Tutigurin power plant, where during the yeah, performance please. test, it was seen that the, uh, the relative humidity did not cross 47% during the two days uh, of the test for the NDCT. The specification by a consultant to NLC at the time of uh, tendering, they had specified 73% RH. So there is an inherent undersizing of the cooling tower without realization. 
that the desired RH is 70% instead of the real uh, level of maybe 45 to 50%. So these are certainly important aspects when it comes to specifying the ambient duty conditions uh, for NDCT or IDCT. Now, when it comes to IDCT, we'll cover another point regarding recirculation and interference allowance from nearby cooling towers in subsequent slides. The next reason is uh, the erroneous specification of recirculation allowance. We'll talk more about it in the, another slide. The unknown or unknown fill characteristics. If there are dozens of fills available in the industry for use in cooling tar, but then only a few of them have been tested in third party laboratories, which is also quite common these days because the public sector end users have started specifying that whatever thermal parameters have been used for sizing the NDCT or IDCT. They'll have to be established before award of contract through a third party testing agency. Uh, as of now, only two agencies are popular in uh, India. Um, I mean, overseas uh, testing agencies are popular in India. One is the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa. The other one is 4J Tech uh, in Czechoslovakia. Only these two uh, testing agencies are able to provide the performance characteristics of various fills in the world. Now, why this point assumes significance is that uh, about five to 10 years ago, any performance characteristics of the fill submitted by the cooling tower designer or the contractor used to be accepted. And whether those characteristics were right or wrong could be known only during a performance test. Only when the tower fails, people will start investigating as to where the problem is and they'll they realize that there is no backup data for the fill performance submitted as part of the tender. Now, with the advent of third party testing, some of the gaps have been uh, uh, filled, but then there is room for further improvement. The other important point is improper tower design or the pressure drop estimates. There is no published data for the pressure drop character characteristics of various fills in the industry, even today. But then there are certain publications in the public domain, which can be referred to, but then it's a matter of specification by the end user. As long as they are not part of the tender specification, no bidder would try to uh, refer to those uh, publications and estimate his pressure drops because it's a competitive environment. Everybody wants their power consumption as low as possible because there is loading on fan power consumption during evaluation. So these aspects of tender specifications are quite specific to India. It is it is non-existent in anywhere, any part of the world, but our specifications are such that the competition becomes intense and there is a tendency uh, to cut corners where uh, it is possible. The next is uh, the improper design of distribution system. Distribution system is basically the network of uh, PVC pipes that carry nozzles to spray hot water over the heat transfer media, which is a fill. Now, improper distribution in the sense, each contractor has his own uh, method of uh, designing the distribution system. Some of the contractors build the hot water duct inside the cooling tower. For ND cities, it is understandable, but for ID city also, the concrete duct is built inside the cooling tower, which is basically an obstruction to airflow. There is a pressure drop because of the uh, duct inside the cooling tower. So nobody considers the pressure drop unless it is imposed by the end user. The other thing is how much water is discharged through each of the nozzles. So that is one gray area where nobody wants to provide backup data. It's It may be a simple exercise using Bernoulli's equations, but then since the tender does not impose a submission of these calculations, nobody checks them. And any nozzle size is submitted as part of the bid. Eventually, the distribution is improper, which affects the distribution of water and air through the fill, which in turn results in the shortfall in performance of the cooling tower. Now, poor fan performance. All these are equally important parameters for the performance of the cooling tower. In India, there are no good fans. Uh, it's a sad statement, but it's a reality. Uh, where the Indian fans uh, do not perform properly. Everybody claims 86%, 88% total efficiency of the fan, which is not possible in reality. Uh, but then there is only one overseas manufacturer in India, Kofenko, uh, who is three times probably uh, more expensive than an Indian fan, so nobody buys from them unless there is an imposition from the client. Uh, several 
projects where the cooling tower was not performing so people have tried to investigate as to how much air flow uh, is being delivered by the fan and in every case not 9 out of 10 but in 10 out of 10 cases they have found there is a shortfall of between 15 to 25 percent in the fan air delivery so that is one major area the where the performance of the cooling tower can be improved now obstructions around the air inlet i'll show you in the next slide as to what i'm actually meaning here the high percentage obstructions inside the cooling tower that is when the thermal design and civil design are done independently when these two designs are compartmentalized, it is quite possible that the civil designer independently designs how many columns and beams should be there in the tower and what should be their sizes, depending on seismic conditions or wind conditions for NDCT. city. So it is possible that an independently designed civil structure will have a lot more obstructions than the one designed jointly by a thermal designer and civil engineer. Because the thermal performance depends on the percentage obstructions to airflow inside the cooling tower. The other one interference from nearby cooling towers, which is related to the recirculation part, because the recirculation and interference both are combined together in one of the CTI bulletins, which is PFM110. This is this point basically relates to the location and siting of the cooling towers. If there are multiple cooling towers, ND cities or ID cities, how to locate them? So, what should be the plot plan? What should be the gap between cooling towers? Whether it should be parallel or they should be in line. So, all those considerations become very important uh, when the performance of the uh, cooling tower is considered at the time of determining the layout. Now, another important point is the absence of a water treatment program. Uh, nowadays, uh, it is seen in most of the power plants that there is no pretreatment for even seawater uh, application. So the understanding is that if a splash fill is used, which is less prone to choking or fouling or biogrowth compared to film fills, the thinking is that splash fills do not choke, so we do not need a water treatment program. Also that the condenser has an online tube cleaning system, so we need not worry about the condenser. So the splash fill is not going to choke, so the cost can be reduced by not having a pretreatment uh, program. So this has been proven to be erroneous. Most of the splash fills used for seawater or brackish water, and sometimes uh, river water where the hardness is quite high, have resulted in fouling and choking of cooling towers. I'll show you some photographs later on. And the scaling by fouling, uh, all these are problems that cannot be attended when it happens to the heat transfer media, which is a plastic fill in a cooling tower. People say that once fouling or scaling happens, it can be cleaned. It can be cleaned if it is a condenser with metal tubing, but in a plastic fill, it is not possible in reality. Now, I spoke about the obstructions to airflow around the air inlet. This is one photograph taken from a side where you see on the back side that there is a lot of vegetation. On the front side, because there are other equipment, other facilities that are provided, it has been uh, concretized very well. No obstructions to air entry into the cooling tower. But on the other side, there is a forest. So that affects the airflow on the other side for this back-to-back -back tower. Now I'll show you another tower which has an inline arrangement. That is, the air inlets are on both sides, but there are there is only one cell in each of the uh, one fan in each of the cells. So if you look at this growth, it is simple negligence on the part of the uh, OEM team that they are not removing this vegetation because this these kind of obstructions to airflow will create additional pressure drop at the air entry. The fan performance will suffer. It will deliver deliver less airflow uh, into the heat transfer media, which in turn will affect the cold water temperature. If you can see these uh, stands, these are the RTDs mounted during a performance guarantee test. Even during such an important event where the performance guarantee test was conducted, and <laughs> under those important conditions, we can still see that neither the contractor nor the power plant owner has bothered to remove this vegetation. So these are some of the fills uh, that will give you a better understanding as to why a water treatment program is necessary for optimal performance of cooling towers. The first one is quite ubiquitous. In most of the power plants until like 10 years ago, right from 1950s, we have been seeing this fill, which is a cross-fluted film fill. 
this particular fill has the highest thermal performance among us the fills that are projected here it has cross flutes and certain horizontal stripes which is called the microstructure uh, this horizontal microstructure combined with the angular flutes increases the residence time of hot water which is passing through the fill the main intention is to create obstruction to the water when it passes through the fill and ensure that it stays as long as possible to exchange heat with air without adversely affecting the pressure drop through this fill media now the next fill is the vertical flute you can see that the water and air path is vertical in this case the residence time is quite small because the water passes through the fill gravitationally very fast but then the advantage of this fill is uh, this is anti fouling it has anti fouling characteristics the deposition rate of uh, scaling and fouling compounds in a straight fluted fill is much less compared to a cross fluted fill and the next fill on the right hand side which is a splash fill this is called a splash grid it has high void age as you can see uh, the mesh is 50 by 50 uh, cm it's a large void is obviously since the void age is high the interaction between air and water is very poor which means the thermal performance of this splash grid is poor but then the anti fouling characteristics are fantastic compared to the fill and fills so it's basically a compromise between the thermal performance of a fill and its anti fouling characteristics so based on the water quality of the makeup water and the availability of a water treatment program a compromise has to be struck between the thermal performance and the anti fouling characteristics required now down below on the left hand side it's the v bar which is also a very common fill in india uh, this particular fill is bent only for use in cross flow but then somehow in india it has become quite popular in counter flow as well so as you can see this is a staggered arrangement where there is a large gap between one fill bar and the other so this is arranged in steps of 200 mm vertical by 200 mm horizontal or 200 vertical by 300 horizontal so various uh, spacing possible for this particular fill and each spacing has a different thermal performance and a pressure drop depending on how dense it is and how lean it is and the middle fill down below is the cross fluted trickle grill this is supposed to be the new age fill for the cooling tower industry whereas all the previous fills are made in polyvinyl chloride that is pvc uh, these two fills the trickle grids cross fluted and off offset fluted these are made in polypropylene uh, polypropylene is not fire retardant uh, as pvc because pvc is inherently fire retardant but pp catches fire so they also have uh, fire resistant polypropylene which is comparatively expensive compared to pvc but then uh, these fills are with open mesh structure this is really an advancement in terms of the heat transfer media uh, this is a simple mesh structure on each sheet these mesh structures are buttoned together to form modules so the module modular formation of a film fill right above in pvc and the modular formation of the pp fill which is a trickle grid is similar both of them are forming a pack heat transfer media pack but then the void age in this trickle grid is quite high because because it has an open mesh structure uh, the last fill is the offset fluted which is similar to a straight fluted film fill so these uh, polypropylene mesh uh, sheets have vertical flutes the thermal performance is obviously quite poor for this vertical fluted trickle grid compared to the cross fluted trickle grid so cross fluted trickle grid has both a high transfer uh, high heat transfer surface as well as low pressure drop so this is a real advancement for the cooling tower industry so right now this uh, particular fill is quite popular but then it is quite expensive i'll show you certain instances where the v bar you have seen here the v bar fill which was which was not supposed to choke under any circumstances in one of the ntpc projects you see that the entire v bar which has slots on its body it has 7 by 7 uh, rhombus shaped openings on its body all those openings are completely choked like cotton like structure it looks like silk and cotton because it is microbial growth uh, this is another plant this is nlc tuticorin uh, this this was splash grid you have seen how uh, 
uh, high the voidage is in uh, splash grid 50 by 50 centimeter openings even those openings are choked here this is seawater cooling tower so it was expected that without a pre treatment for the seawater uh, the splash grid uh, will still survive but you can see that there is so much of debris in the uh, retransfer media that the thermal performance was severely affected here now the choking of various fills you are seeing the trickle grid uh, which is choked under certain conditions where there was no pre treatment of water again so it's not possible to have a clean fill <clears throat> without having some basic water treatment program there is no fill in the world that will work uh, without clean water inside a cooling tower now when it come when we come to the own dam aspects you are able to see the huge amount of oil that is floating in the basin so the water surface has a large layer of um, oil and nobody knows in the plant as to how this oil has come into the cooling tower basin but then when this large amount of oil is circulated through the distribution system it forms a layer not only in the distribution system but on the fill packs as well so the evaporation loss that is supposed to happen to cool water will not happen if there is oil in circulation and not only the thermal performance gets affected it promotes bio growth that is whatever microbial organisms get circulated through the water they'll find enough food uh, to multiply so once once they start growing inside the heat transfer surface they tend to start collecting debris so eventually the debris has to be sent to a chemical laboratory to find out what its constituents are and what are the reasons as to why that debris has formed so it becomes a long exercise and expensive exercise now if you look at the distribution system uh, there is very bad choking in the distribution system uh, this is a nozzle which is completely choked this you are seeing the pipe above without the nozzle this is the adapter of the nozzle which is connected to the pipe if you see the debris this is basically the polyurethane coating in the hot water pipe from the condenser to the cooling tower so this was the sea water cooling tower where there was pu coating to protect the ms liner but it so happened that the power plant operator realized that the workmanship was so poor the pu coating was getting peeled off in bits and pieces all those small pieces are were getting entrapped in the distribution system there was no water flow through the distribution system so it was like looking at niagara falls for a brief period at that particular project site because the most of the hot water that was trying to enter the pipes uh, encountered a lot of debris in the pipes so it was flowing back from the hot water duct outside now this is another poor own dam practice where you see on the roof deck of an induced draft cooling tower the own dam team was storing the oil cans so on the right hand side if you see there are marks of uh, the oil being drained from the gearbox uh, for maintenance all the uh, oil that was to be replaced was drained on the idc2 roof deck it eventually found entry into the uh, cooling tower through the access hatch on the top so once it enters the cooling tower there is no way of cleaning the heat transfer media even though they say acid acid circulation will uh, improve the situation but in reality it hasn't the other one the door that you are seeing is basically the access door uh, to the fan you will see that this is a metal door in most of the cases these days they are asking for frp doors but then there is also a legacy problem where metal doors are preferred because they are heavy Uh, less prone to maintenance but then you see the initial installation is, itself is so bad that it is not closing properly so there is a lot of air bypass into the fan stack so a percentage of air instead of passing through the air inlet it is passing from below the fan because this is the least path of resistance uh, this is from the same project where you see the discoloration of the fill because of uh, oil ingress into the cooling tower Uh, this is uh, the drift eliminator portion that you are seeing there is so much of deposition on the drift eliminator because of no water treatment program at all so these are um, this is a calcium stuff white colored that has completely blocked the uh, drift eliminator 
So if the drift letter condition is like this, so it is not possible for air to pass through the drift letter, which in turn increases the static pressure to the fan, which delivers less and less air. So which in turn results in high cold water temperature of the cooling tower. Uh, this is one of the locations where the distribution system is designed very badly. So this is a poor way of designing it. You see that uh, most of the nozzles are overlaid with the beam. So whatever spray comes out of this nozzle, it will directly hit the beam. And the fills below, these are V-bar fills, you are seeing white lines. The fill will, rec will not receive in the portion where the beam is existing. So this was one particular contract uh, where we found that the highlighted portion, the clouded portion is the central hot water duct inside the cooling tower. To begin with, having a RCC duct inside a cooling tower is a bad idea because the dimension of this duct is about one meter by one meter. So that large area is blocked for uh, airflow. And as you can see, the duct is not located centrally. This is an example where the thermal designer designs his cooling tower independently, and so does the civil designer. Civil designer located the duct wherever he could find uh, an obstruction free area. He could not locate it centrally because at the central location there were columns and beams. So he moved the position of the duct in such a way that he had no problems in locating it. Now, if you see on the left-hand side, the overall length of the PVC distribution pipes is smaller than the length on the right-hand side. So there is unequal distribution of uh, hot water on both sides. So the only way to rectify it because the civil structure is already standing is by varying the nozzles. If you see the nozzle sizes are continuously varying and at the end, the size of the nozzle is smaller because we want to eliminate wall bypass because the more water falls on the wall it bypasses the fill and falls directly into the basin so so much water is uncooled and hot water falls into the basin to eliminate that uh, particular situation the nozzle sizes have been uh, uh, reduced at the end and right from uh, the duct on either side the nozzle sizes have been calculated in such a way that the discharge through each of the nozzles on either side is fixed constant so that was the only uh, method of solving that problem. Now, when it comes to the overall uh, measures on the improvement of performance, if you look at the new towers, now you have to keep in mind that the layout plays an important role when it comes to the performance of cooling towers. In this regard, even though the industry knows that the PFM 110 guidelines published by Cooling Technology Institute adequately describe <laughs> adequately describes as to how the cooling towers will have to be positioned in a layout. The industry seldom follows it because of competition. They look at the specifications. If the specification imposes this particular guideline, they follow it. If there is no specification, then everybody skips it. Just go by specification where no recirculation or very little recirculation that has no relevance to the published code. They simply follow it and undersize the cooling tower. So there are guidelines that will tell you how to calculate the recirculation allowance depending on the overall water flow. Say, for example, each cooling tower in a large power plant has 30,000 meter cube uh, per hour flow. But then there are four such towers in the layout. The total water flow under consideration should be 30,000 into four, which is 1,20,000 uh, meter cube per hour, should be the water flow considered for recirculation allowance. And then depending on temperature duty, that is the range, which is hot water minus cold water temperature, the range of the cooling tower and the approach of the cooling tower are two parameters which will be used for correcting the recirculation from the uh, overall water flow rate. So there are clear guidelines given in PFM 110 uh, for the siting and then estimation of uh, recirculation interference. If that particular bulletin is followed, it is possible that the size of the cooling tower or for an IDCT, the uh, fan power consumption will increase because that is what it takes for a performing cooling car. Hence, these guidelines cannot be sidestep, side steps with a with a main motive of uh, providing lesser airflow for becoming the lowest bidder uh, in a competitive environment. Now, in this regard, there is a development uh, in our country uh, where the absence of the, an Indian standard uh, when it comes to thermic design of NDCTs and IDCTs has been felt based on multiple requests of end users and also the industry players where 
the competition is actually destroying the field in terms of uh, shortfall in performance. Uh, based on such requests, uh, the CODEL committee, which used to handle the civil design course for uh, NDCT and IDCT, uh, that is IS-11504 for NDCT and IS-456 uh, for IDCT. IDCT is a simple building structure, so IS-456. These two CODEL committees took the opportunity to form a subcommittee for uh, evolving the thermal design guidelines uh, for NDCTs and IDCTs. So those guidelines have been in preparation for the last three years. So finally, the draft was finalized among the subcommittee and it was put up on BIS website for wide circulation. The wide circulation date uh, was until 8th of March. Is a few, uh, last week was the last date. Several comments were received. Now the final uh, draft is under preparation. Probably this month, uh, the BIS standard uh, for thermic design of NDCTs and IDCTs is going to be uh, published. So we should all hope that after the publication, there will be some improvement in the quality of designs of cooling towers in the future. Now, to specify the right uh, fill based on circulating water quality. It, the end user plays an important role when it comes to water quality because uh, he has the control on the cost of, there is a budget of uh, budget allocation for the power plant. If the water treatment system is skipped to reduce cost, there will be a lot of suffering in terms of uh, O&M. And then there will also be contractual issues when the cooling tower, heat transfer media and the distribution uh, system gets choked. Now, ensure that the field performance characteristics being proposed by bidders or contractors are based on third-party laboratory tests. So this is being already done by the PSUs in the country. The private sector is yet to catch up because it is price sensitive. If uh, this condition is imposed in the tender and the contractor is expected to go to University of Stellenbosch or uh, Forge Tech in Czechoslovakia, obviously there is going to be a cost and it is going to be as part of his bid. But then by specifying uh, this simple line in the tender, they will be avoiding a lot of costs in the future in terms of um, improved, uh, in terms of um, uh, shortfall in performance of the cooling tower and also the fouling and choking of the fills. The next is there are certain small things uh, which need to be specified in the contract, like the performance, the heat transfer performance in the rain zone. Rain zone is basically the water droplets that exit the fill media, water droplets that fall from the fill into the basin. So it is like a rain below the fill and the water exits the heat transfer media to fall into the basin. That rain zone comes in contact uh, with the ambient air when the air enters the air inlet. So this is the first zone where heat transfer is appearing. But then there is a tendency in the industry to consider the heat transfer in this rain zone for ID cities as well. The height of the air inlet in ID cities is very small. So the impact of rain zone on the KV bell, which is the heat transfer uh, in the cooling tower is quite small. So it has to be neglected and there has to be some conservativeness in design because this cooling tower will have to perform for at least 40 years based on the life of the plant. The same reason applies to the spray zone. Spray zone is the area where the nozzles spray hot water onto the fill. There is some heat transfer in that particular zone as well, but then because of maintenance, maintenance issues and the absence of a water treatment plant, within the first two years, there is a lot of fouling and choking of the spray zone. Also the uh, fill media in certain cases, but then the spray zone gets affected first because that is the area where the hot water is entering first. So if the spray zone gets fouled, then there is no point in considering the heat transfer in that spray zone. So these are certain aspects in cooling tower design which the end user may specify, specific to ID cities where the heat transfer in drain zone and spray zone must be prohibited, which means that the entire heat transfer has to occur in the heat transfer media alone. And also it becomes quite easy for evaluation because the thermal characteristics of various fills are published and also the BIS code will carry a lot of information on uh, fill uh, characteristics. So once the equations are known, it's quite easy to compare uh, all the bits. Uh, the same reason applies to NDCT where the spray zone heat transfer has to be neglected. But in rain zone can be considered in NDCT because the air inlets are quite large. Now, when we come to the existing cooling tasks, uh, there is a big problem here. 
based on uh, certain public uh, certain publications of uh, CEA during the past 10 years, uh, it looks like they have identified about 30,000 megawatt of uh, capacity for upgradation and more, uh, modernization. But then if you look at the cooling tower, even without the r and measures, in its current situation, the cooling towers are not performing properly because most of the CTI third-party tests have given the results in the range of uh, 65 to 70% thermal capability. Plus minus 5% is acceptable, but then a shortfall of 35% is too large for any heat transfer equipment. Now, when it comes to the exist existing cooling towers, there is only one way of determining as to what could be the reason for shortfall in the performance. So to begin with, we have to start evaluating, theoretical evaluation of the original thermal design of the contractor. So what are data sheets are available? What are geo drawings are available? from the time of ordering. So one has to study that, perform a theoretical analysis based on the BIS guidelines as to whether the uh, design was 95% capable or 70% capable. So you will know the gap in performance with theoretical evaluation. Now the, <clears throat> after the theoretical evaluation is complete, <clears throat> there has to be a performance test of the cooling tower in its current condition. It is possible that a part of the cooling tower, that is the distribution system and the fill is fouled. It may be part fouling or it could be a serious fouling. If it is serious fouling, it is easy to identify by visual inspection. So some amount of fill, that is whatever layer is uh, fouled and choked, those layers can be replaced to improve the performance. The same with the distribution system, nozzles can be changed with better performing nozzles. Now once that is done, or if the cooling tower is in good condition without any fouling, then the other way of establishing the performance after the theoretical evaluation is through a performance test. This is a simple test. Uh, there is an unnecessary fear in the mind of the end user thinking that the performance test is a big activity and they cannot do it themselves. It's not true. We have helped uh, so many uh, end users to perform the test themselves because what they uh, finally require is about 12 RTDs. Even if they do not have a pitot tube for measuring the water flow, it's uh, all right. Because most of the power plants are not providing a uh, location that is a pit for uh, using the pitot tube for measuring the water flow. That facility is absent in more, most of the power plants. Uh, the normal method is to go for ultrasonic uh, flow measurement, uh, which is slightly um, erroneous compared to the pitot tube, maybe plus minus 5% accuracy for uh, ultrasonic measurement compared to plus minus 2% for uh, uh, the pitot tube. But for performance establishment for an existing cooling tower, uh, ultra, ultrasonic uh, flow measurement is good enough. So that is the only external device uh, that they have to procure. The RTDs are already available in the power plant. Only thing is somebody has to explain to them as to where and how to locate these RTDs. And the data logger is another simple device which is always existent in most of the power plants. If they do not have it, they can buy it from somebody like Thompson's who supply the RTDs. They also give a data logger, very small data logger specific for the use of cooling tasks. It comes for a cost of one and a half to two lakh rupees. It's a small cost. The plant engineers themselves uh, can devise a system for evaluating the performance of the existing cooling tower without outside intervention because they can avoid a lot of uh, problems by not inviting an outside agency and eliminate any external influences in terms of the report submission. Now, the fouling scaling is uh, an important matter that we have discussed so far, but then uh, the cooling tower water treatment uh, is a less understood subject uh, in our country. Even the best uh, water treatment uh, companies that we have are unable to provide a tailor-made solution uh, to each and every site, depending on the specific problems related to the site. There are sites with uh, seawater, but then again, uh, seawater in various sites has uh, different constituents. Uh, river water is widely varying in terms of its uh, constituents. Uh, these silica scales, that form on the upper layers of the heat transfer media uh, where the temperature of hot water is high. That is when it is just spread over the fill, uh, 
uh, the gradient is quite high. So the silica scales come out of solution on the upper layers, but then in the lower layers, you'll always see uh, softer scales like um, calcium-based scales, calcium <clears throat> magnesium scales, all these softer scales, which can be cleaned uh, at low temperature regions uh, that form on, at the lower layers. The fill manufacturers usually say that the fill can be easily cleaned, but it applies only to the softer scales. And the PVC film films are difficult to clean because if you use a high pressure water jet, it is quite possible that the PVC uh, fill sheets get torn because the thickness is only 0.25 millimeters. They hold in position quite strong only because they are either glued or turned through mechanical assembly. But then the assembly gets distorted when a high pressure jet is used on plastic fills. But then uh, the trickle grid fills, which are made in polypropylene, uh, can withstand high pressures because uh, it is made of a mesh structure. So whatever pressure it passes through the voltage. So certain in certain cases, depending on the type of uh, the scaling, uh, the trickle grid fills can be cleaned, but then the PVC fills cannot be cleaned. So the best way of avoiding fouling is by having at least some basic water treatment program. So these are uh, basically the measures that one can uh, look at when it comes to specifying a new cooling tower and uh, looking for improvement in an existing cooling tower. So these are the... Uh, points in a nutshell. Now, in a case where the design shortfall in thermal design is found, determine whether it is because of design deficiency or fouling. So there is always a combination. In most of the cases, the design deficiency and the fouling both play a part if it is an existing cooling tower. If it is a new cooling tower, it is quite easy to zero in on the reasons. Now, when it comes to the replacement of fills, we have found in certain uh, cases where the end user is quite enthusiastic in improving the performance of his cooling tower. But then when he realizes that there is some civil work involved in it, uh, he is put off because they usually believe that the replacement involves only removing the existing fill and introducing a new type of fill. And they think that the performance automatically improves. It's not like that. For example, if there is a splash fill in a cooling tower, especially a V-bar that requires a very large height. The minimum height of the uh, V-bar tower, whether it is an IDCT or NDCT, is about 4.8 meters. So a large portion of the static head is taken away by the height of the fill itself. But when you look at the modular fills, whether it is film or trickle, the maximum height is more or less limited to 1.8 meters. So there is a big difference in the static head between splash fills and film fills. Now, if, it is, if an existing cooling tower is a splash fill cooling tower, because the height of the fill is large, the amount of static head available for the air inlet will be less. That is, the height of the air inlet will be less. So in such cases, what happens is the designer provides a smaller air inlet, depending on the overall available pumping head, and provides a large uh, static head for the fill, because the tower has to have certain heat transfer characteristic. So the fill has to be a minimum height. Now, because the air inlet in splash fills, uh, splash fill towers is small, and when you try to replace the splash fills with the new age fills like trickle grid, the replacement height is only 1.8 meters. So a 4.8 meter splash fill is being replaced with a uh, 1.8 meter modular fill. So in that case, there is a possibility of increasing the air inlet by way of uh, uh, removing the cladding wall, the wall above the air inlet. We can uh, uh, demolish the wall to the next beam level. By increasing the air inlet, the resistance to airflow through the air inlet, which is basically the pressure drop through the air inlet, reduces. If the static pressure for the fan reduces by way of increased freedom for air entry into the cooling tower, the air delivery through the cooling tower will also improve. So this is an important criteria where the end users are unable to digest because there is a cost and time factor when, it, uh, when the civil works get involved. So there are cases where the reports have been submitted, the report has been accepted, when it comes to implementation, just because there is civil work, the entire exercise has been postponed. So eventually, the requirement is that a good custom-made OM program is a prerequisite for continued thermal performance of cooling tasks, whether it is in terms of water treatment or frequent inspections of the cooling tower 
uh, like we have seen instances where large amount of oil is floating on the cooling tower basin or the maintenance of the gearboxes are being done on the roof deck of the cooling tower. These are simple, unacceptable cases where the OM engineers may come up with a program where the cooling tower is maintained in a neat and clean condition so that uh, everybody realizes that cold water temperature is nothing but money. The better the cold water temperature, the better are the savings. And nowadays, since the focus is on carbon emissions as well, if the cooling tower performance performs well, the condenser vacuum holds well. So the consumption of coal per megawatt generate, generated also comes back to the design level. So the carbon emissions will also be under control. So these are the simple aspects where the cooling tower performance can be improved. Yeah, thank you all. Hello. Uh, yes, Mr. Chandrasekhar. Yes, sir. Yeah, Mr. Gupal, thank you very much. Quite an exhaustive uh, insight of uh, what cooling towers can play a role in a power plant. Uh, I have only a few. A few are, are you not in the video, Mr. Gupal? My, uh, I'm actually. Uh, talking through my hotspot, so there is okay, a strong okay. issue. So I, I have only a few things, you know, on a closed loop uh, cooling tower cycle, where COC yes. plays a major role. Yes. Uh, what kind of advice would you like to give it to the attendees in terms of uh, COC vis-a-vis uh, scale inhibitor program uh, that can be put online? Yeah, see, basically this COC is, quite okay as long as they have a water treatment program. For example, in a seawater cooling tower, the general restriction on the COC is 1.8. The ideal COC is 1.5, but then people stretch it because they don't want uh, too much of makeup water uh, being pumped into the cooling tower. So even if they consider the extreme limit of 1.8, these days because of a zero discharge concept, uh, the sludge pit operation is also very rare. So no water either from the freshwater pumping system or from the seawater goes to the treatment plant. Hmm. So the COC will be limited by the water treatment program they have. Even if it is good quality uh, river water, they cannot have a high COC of five, six, seven without having a basic water treatment program. It is possible that the condenser can be maintained in clean condition without a water treatment program. But for cooling tower part, it is impossible to have a system where it is maintained in clean condition without having a basic treatment program. So this COC is inherently linked with the water treatment program. Okay. And what about the scale inhibitor program? Because, uh, because currently it is offline into a lab. Uh, what is your uh, take on making it an online to the operator? Yeah, there are already, there are already plants, say for example, Rain Calcining Limited. Uh, it is an old uh, uh, petroleum coke making plant in uh, Vizag. Uh, I think it was commissioned sometime in uh, 1997. Okay. Uh, that was the first cooling tower in India, Indus Draft cooling tower with a film fill for seawater application. It was never done anywhere in the world, but they wanted to experiment with film fill because they thought even if film fill gets choked within five years of its operation in seawater, the replacement cost will be much less compared to the investment cost of a splash fill cooling tower. So with that, uh, point of view, they experimented it, but it so happened that the film fill of 27 mm uh, fluid size was working quite well, but then they had an elaborate water treatment system through a company called Beds Dearborn. So that Beds Dearborn introduced an online uh, uh, scale inhibition program. They also had a biocide uh, inhibition program, but then it is possible to have online monitoring. Only thing is, these are all limited by the budget. Correct, correct. See, whereas on the steam and water cycle, you know, some plants have that SWAS system connected to online. Yes. But on the CW side, uh, this scale inhibitor program is something my uh, request to most of the attendees is to look into what Bhupal is suggesting in Vizag somewhere. So let's have a look into it and so that this also plays an important role. Uh, in maintaining the contents of IQ. This is number one. Second thing, um, what is your take on this variable speed cooling tower fans? Uh, in India, so far, the need has been not 
uh, need has not been felt because the variation in the climatic climatic no but because why why, why why i am raising this question is because of the too much of partial load operation and indifferent cycle of operation yeah. well, what is your take on this uh, city fan yeah as a cooling tower uh, designer i would opt for reduced number of uh, cell operation for the idcity instead of hang a variable speed drive because in india uh, where the uh, weather conditions are not that erratic like if you do not have a wet bulb temperature in the a uh, neighborhood of say 15 degree 10 degree such low wet bulb temperatures are not possible in most part of the country so the wet bulb temperature range is within plus minus 8.5 degree centigrade to design say okay. at a location you have 28 degree design wet bulb it can drop to 20 degree at best or it can go as high as 30 33 or 34 degree not beyond that so for this known variation in the ambient temperature conditions we really do not require a variable speed drive which is expensive instead we can start switching on and switching off the number of cells in the cooling tower okay understood now there is a question from one of the attendees mr anupam bhattacharya uh, he is asking a question is there any feedback on mrs maya frp fans these fans we are using in our paharpur cooling tower five, three cells and sorry and achieve up to 30% of power saving per cell in our city your answer please i am a little uncomfortable when it comes to uh, any question on the fan air flow because uh, this is uh, such a subject where each of these fan manufacturers are competing with the other manufacturer in the replacement market it is impossible to claim 10 15 20 30 percent improvement in uh, the air delivery compared to the previous fan supplied by some x vendor so because of the competition even though all these fan manufacturers have almost uh, the similar blade designs all the blade designs in india are from uh, sirocco howden in the past okay is a european company which had an office in india they had licensed one or two companies in the past uh, to manufacture their fans so the partners of that company have split and they have started multiple companies from there the blade designs have uh, been accessed by various manufacturers yeah Now, if you ha- if you have anything written documentation you know you can share uh, with mr anupam bhattacharya offline yeah but uh, then uh, yeah. when it comes to making recommendations on the vendors i will not make it because no you are not you are you are not recommending you are just sharing your views that's it yeah i can the rest is up to them there is one more question coming from nlcil we are telling more insights on interference of nearby cooling towers yes i would recommend them to look at pfm 110 code uh, by cti if they do not have it they can share email id to cee they can contact me i'll share that particular guideline for them great thank you thank you yeah thank you mr bappal this that's all from from my side thank Shreya, you thank you so much yeah. yes thank yes, you so thanks. much and uh, Uh, we'll now go back to mr bandopadhyay for uh, his presentation uh, he has shared his presentation with us uh, mr bandopadhyay requesting you to put your video on and in the meanwhile uh, we would have our team share your ppt